Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to the CARSIP, which is the Caribbean Regional Communications Infrastructure Program, Lot 3, Public Consultation and Stakeholder Engagement for Lot 3 of the project. My name is Crystal Francis. I am the Digicel Market Project Manager for CARSIP and Lot 3 Program Manager. At this point, I would like to establish protocol Good morning, Dr. Gerald Thompson, advisor to the government on special projects. Mr. Thompson was integral to the inception of CARSIP as the Minister of Telecoms at the time. Mr. Apollo Knights, the director of the NTRC. Ms. Marcel Edwards John, Deputy Director of the Ministry of Planning, Finance, Economic Planning, Sustainable Development, and Information Technology. Ms. Jacinta Fergus, Deputy Director of the ITSD. Media houses, members of the general public. Today we're going to go through a very straightforward approach to this consultation. Um, protocol being established, I'm going to introduce you to the panel who's sitting here with me. We'll go through a presentation by the government of St. Vincent, represented by Ms. Edwards John. We'll have an overview of CARSIP itself by myself, the project manager, Nigel Irvin, my colleague to my right. We'll go through the Lot 3 sub C project. Then we'll establish the grievance mechanism, which is set up for the public, and then open the floor to questions and answers from, from yourselves. So, with no further ado, um, starting from my far left, Ms. Roxanne John, the Government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines Carson Coordinator. Ms. Marcel Edwards John, Deputy Director of the Ministry of Finance, Economic Planning, Sustainable Development and Information Technology. To my right, Mr. Nigel Irvin of Deep Blue Cable. And to my far right, Mr. Greg Stoner of International Development.
a fiber ring protected with a fat wall. 100% of this fiber to all sites in St. Vincent and the Renegades, and a full 10 gig and 1 gig line speed dedicated to the government. Under this G1, there will be 225 devices connected within these government buildings. Additionally, there will be the delivery of a government PBX service, which is fully redundant, and this centralized system will provide IP PBX services to all government locations. This includes a SVG 911 PBX, which is fully redundant and will be located at the police headquarters. Within, <laughs> within the IP PBX system, there will be over 1,300 devices connected. This project is now fully on stream and is running on schedule. Based on the program milestones located on this slide deck in front of you, we can see for the G1 Core Lot 1, we are now in the stage where we are rolling out to terrestrial fiber. This includes both underground and aerial fiber deployed throughout St. Vincent and Grenadine. This consultation focuses on lot three, the subsea component. We have achieved three milestones within this project, within this component of the project, and are now presently executing the final version of the ESIA, which is the Environmental, Environmental Social Impact Assessment, which is mandated by the World Bank. This public consultation forms one of the key components of this ESIA delivery and it is absolutely necessary to engage the public and ensure that all concerns are taken into consideration before this project goes into full swing. That being said, Digicel is committed to ensuring that all processes, procedures, and applications for planning are followed to the T and will be in full compliance with all mandates and recommendations from the Government of St. Vincent. I'll hand over to the Government of St. Vincent, as outlined in the agenda, to Ms. Marcel Edwards-John, who will be making a small presentation. Um, to hold on this thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Crystal. And I take note of the need to make it short. <laughs> um, I want to bring you the government's perspective on the, the on the sea cable network system that we're here to discuss today. But I want to set it in the context of the overall development objective and strategy of the government. I will do that and I, I will then attempt to tell you a bit more about the, the CASI and to then take you through what from the government perspectives we consider to be the key benefits of this particular initiative. As we are aware, the ICT sector plays a very important role in development. And the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines recognizes the importance of creating a modern, vibrant information and technology sector as a catalyst for growth, bringing opportunities for employment, for efficient and transparent government, and for innovation and entrepreneurship. But to a large extent, I'm sure you all realize that these gains depend on how well we can integrate into the global economy. But meaningful re integration requires, among other things, significant investments in ICT, specifically in building a robust telecommunication infrastructure. Over the last two decades or so, St. Vincent and Grenadines has made significant strides in ICT, and I'm sure we can all attest to that. In particular, we know the positive trends in internet and broadband connectivity, which have translated into greater access for businesses as well as governments, households, and individuals. More and more, we see businesses leveraging improved connectivity to promote their products and their services as they continue to find it increasingly easier to connect with regional and international markets. But there are still gaps. So as we move to narrow or move closer to narrowing the digital divide, 
The government of services in the Gwen Days, along with Grenada and St. Lucia, as mentioned by Christian earlier, as being the other partners or the other countries participating in the concept, the government requested um, assistance from the World Bank to implement the Caribbean Regional Communication Infrastructure Project, which is now known as the CASIP. Now in 2012, under the leadership of um, Dr. Gerald Thompson, he was very inspirational at that point, the government secured financing from the World Bank and embarked on what we now consider to be the largest ICT investment projects with the commencement of the CASIP. Now, the CASIP is fully aligned to the National Development Strategy as it supports the government's objective of leveraging, leveraging ICT to transform the economy. Um, I'm sure um, a few years ago, in this very same hall, we launched the National and Economic Social Development Plan for the period 2013 to 2025. That is the development blueprint for St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and the CASIP is well located or well sited within that particular, within the, within the plan. Now, the CASIP on completion will contribute to extending the government's communication infrastructure in order to improve internal business processes extend services, and this is important, to underserved communities, as well as facilitating greater access to information. Now, as we know, information has become global, and faster access to information is, in many ways, a competitive advantage for any country. Now, the CASIP, under the esteemed leadership of our project coordinator, Roxanne John, is being implemented by Finance, economic planning, sustainable development, and information technology. The CASIP has two main components. Component one is the regional connectivity infrastructure. And this component is geared towards the development of high speed broadband backbone network and to the enhancement of government wide area network through a public private partnership. Hence, our agreement with Digicel. And this is the component that is the focus of today's consultation. The other component, component two, which is ICT-led innovation, supports incubation of businesses in ICT and ICT-enabled service industries, and it provides training in a range of ICT areas. Now, on the component one, a broadband assessment and transaction advice consultant was engaged to conduct a comprehensive study in order to determine the telecommunications gap in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And this was a necessary first step. The study revealed that fiber optics have been widely deployed by the providers and that there are no major coverage gaps with the exception of connectivity to the Grenadine Islands. Now the Grenadines is presently served, I am told, by the experts and of which are, and I'm not one for sure. It's presently served with microwave radio technology, which is expected to be exhausted in the foreseeable future due to increasing demand that is forecasted, as well as the bandwidth requirements of 4G and future LTE coverage. Now, with the limited growth potential of existing and future microwave spectrums, I have been advised, or we have been advised, the government has been advised that the most feasible option for providing robust telecommunication services in the Grenadines is to install an undersea fiber optic cable system. This system will connect the main island of St. Vincent with the larger Grenadine Islands. And these larger islands will connect to the smaller islands by microwave. So how did we get to where we are now? We are here today at this consultation. Through a competitive bidding process and, I dare say, very rigorous negotiations, Digicel OECS Limited was awarded a PPP, private, Public Private Partnership Contract, in July last year to provide this on the cable system, spanning the area from St. Vincent southwards to Grenada, with cable landing stations on Beckway, Canawan, Musty, Union Island, and Caribou. Now, Digicel contract is for the design construction, operation, and maintenance of the system. As Crystal mentioned, there are other components of the, the contract, the G1 and the IPPBX. 
Now, to say a bit more about how the government perceives the benefits of the policy came up, the establishment of this system is expected to significantly improve the quality of internet services offered in the Grenadines and thus eventually increase the broadband penetration ratings in Vincent, the latter being a, an indicator or measurement of the, IC, of the level of ICT development in any country. The system will also, on completion, meet the growing demands for broadband services as a result of increasing backward requirements of 4G and the ever increasing bandwidth demands from residents, business communities, governments, and visitors to our shores. Based on the last population census 2012, the Grenadines has a population of approximately 16,000 persons. Importantly as well, with the Grenadines being tourism oriented, the honesty system is expected to enhance the competitiveness of this segment of our tourism product. Increasingly, visitors expect broadband communication to be comparable with the services available at home. In addition, there is demand for e-government e -government applications that would eliminate the need to physically come to Kingstown for passport, licenses, birth certificates, and other such services. Now, it is expected that this infrastructure that we're here to talk about today will create an enabling environment that will facilitate the delivery of more easily accessible services particularly to persons living in the Grenadines. Now, while we cannot predict what technologies would be developed in the next five to 10 years, what is in fact certain is that the use of computers, servers, content delivery systems, education, healthcare, public safety, and other operations of government, including those provided by the Inland Revenue Customs Department, these will all require increasing amounts of bandwidth to deliver services, as will the public's use of social media and the growth of video-based traffic. All of these will continue to drive increases in bandwidth requirements. Correct? Good. So the honesty cable is designed to address such. So that's basically what I'm here to say on behalf of the government. But I want to conclude by taking this opportunity to urge you all to participate fully in the consultation. As, as key stakeholders, and I note in the room that we are mainly public sector stakeholders, um, I'm asking that you know, we all continue to work assiduously towards the successful implementation of this critical component of the CASIP. All this, colleagues, in anticipation of significant benefits that this investment will bring to the economic and social development of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to follow on now with a little more detail about the backbone of the internet. Um, it's how we say, narrow the digital divide and create those high bandwidth um, backbone networks. Interesting, a lot of the content providers these days, Amazon, Google, uh, Apple, um, Facebook, they're all building their own networks, so that's how important it is. So if you carry that small poll, I'm pretty sure most people on the high street would go, how do they look to the sky and point to satellites? It's not the case. Submarine cables have been the backbone of communication for many hundreds of years, going back 150 years to his embarking the Brunel telegraph cables to today submarine fiber optic cables. And as has been explained, this project is to um, deploy a submarine cable uh, in no other different way than we do all around the world currently. And this cable, CASIP cable, connects uh, the islands of St. Vincent, Grenada, uh, and the intervening main five Grenadine islands of Bequay, Musty, Panama, Union, Caribbean, with, uh, as has been explained, microwave links to the smaller islands. As listed on the screen. Um, with this cable, uh, it's a 12 fiber pair cable, we'll be able to provide uh, cable, fiber, cable direct, fiber connectivity direct between the islands and the main islands of St. Vincent and Grenada, uh, and fiber connectivity between the two islands of St. Vincent and Grenada. 
uh, initial deployment of um, uh, 40 gigs, so I think to the government is a fraction of what this cable will ultimately deliver. Um, currently, and I'll explain a little more on the following slide, Digicel already uh, owns a submarine fiber optic cable between two main islands, but as has been explained, this cable will supplement uh, the uh, and improve greatly upon the existing microwave links to the Grenadine Islands, which are by definition subject to atmospheric conditions. And with a fiber optic cable, the capacity is coming by the speed of light. Bandwidth is uh, certainly a great deal uh, more improved from the microwave links. More resiliency, redundancy, uh, and bandwidth to the islands. Uh, I'm not showing on this map, but I'll show it in a later one. Is an existing, uh, sorry, additional submarine cable that will link the top of uh, the main island St. Vincent, uh, where the Sufair volcano prevents terrestrial round island connectivity. So we'll be installing a separate festoon between the villages of Chateau Belair and Olia. Slide so just a bit of background about who we are and how this is contracted. Um, so say Digicel already own a cable system called Southern Caribbean Fibre, which in its, uh, in its various constituent parts links uh, from the south uh, in Trinidad uh, to uh, St. Croix in, in the north, uh, with existing links and additional links from Barbados and Asia up to St. Croix, and on this Puerto Rico. Um, <coughs> this cable system however only links the Leeward and Windward Islands and so the owner of Digicel, uh, uh, Mr. Dennis O'Brien, is building a, an extended network from the Grenadine, uh, sorry, from the Windward and Leeward Islands uh, out to the Americas. A deep blue cable, uh, the company I work for, founded by Dennis O'Brien, is doing so. Uh, a submarine cable, uh, submarine matter experts, we've been assisting Digicel over the last several months in contracting and having deployment of the car SIP system. Please. So, following those lengthy negotiations that were referred to between Digicel and uh, the governments, um, we were also supporting in the parallel process of contracting uh, marine uh, contracting uh, specialists and following a similar rigorous uh, contract procurement and negotiation process, International Telecom, Greg's representing, we'll speak later. International Telecom of Canada were selected as the preferred and ultimately contracted specialist to provide marine insulation. Uh, that contract effectively of August uh, is between their Barbados entity and a special purpose vehicle set up by Digicel, which was a requirement of the World Bank, uh, Digicel Grenada Cable Company. Uh, and that contract now to deliver this World Bank funded contract is well enforced, well underway. And as Crystal has explained, uh, we are here as part of that process for the public consultation. So, again, as Crystal has explained, part of the World Bank requirement is to undertake, undertake not only any NEIA but an environmental and social impact assessment, looking at all environmental and social aspects of the proposal. This draft ESA has been completed um, and delivered to the governments in December, and here we are now as a public consultation following that submission to um, supplement and build upon that draft submission. Uh, IT are also responsible for the uh, marine routes and beach manual uh, permit applications uh, on behalf of the relevant planning authorities in both islands. Um, and as you will see below, uh, those have either been approved in the case, this is just the beach manual construction, uh, approved in the case of uh, St Vincent, for, for which I'm very grateful on behalf of Digicel for your prompt review uh, and approval. Um, that process is also continuing in Grenada with those submissions you also made uh, in December. So the next slide just confirms as my statement that um, the um, positions for the proposed landing of the Southern Cables in St. Vincent and Beach Manor constructions were, uh, have now been received. Um, and uh, any more details on those can be provided to you. I'd just like to now follow up a few slides when we get to the pictures now, just the exciting bit, um, and show you where we're proposing to build this cable. 
Uh, the previous picture showed the proposed route, um, and what you see here on the left is uh, the reality of what we uh, undertook in terms of a marine survey. Uh, as part of the geoproper process of the ESLIA process, we looked at various landing options, um, and we did that initially in a desk place uh, cable route study, from which we then selected a preferred landing to uh, undertake a marine survey. So from that, the uh, landings in uh, Bologna and Grenada is at the, uh, at the conference beach, which I'll point out is on the west Atlantic facing, sorry, the east Atlantic facing north uh, east coast of Grenada. The reason for that is that um, uh, there is an undersea volcano uh, to the northwest of Grenada called Kip and Jenny. Um, and that happened to take out uh, both submarine cables, with the existing submarine cables, two years ago. So by landing uh, at a different uh, eastern uh, landing, we're uh, hopefully going to avoid that uh, repetition of that event. Um, the landing here in St. Vincent uh, at uh, Kingston is at the existing landing uh, adjacent the Crick Stadium in Harness Vale, and that's where the um, current digital SCF cable lands. So uh, we're fortunate not to have to be able to build any new infrastructure there. So I'm just going to show a few slides of the landings and uh, some of the survey data, which hopefully you can see uh, plenty more survey data if anyone wanted to look in more detail at it. Um, the seabed topography around the internet is quite fascinating. It's a volcanic island, of course, and the uh, bottom of the seabed shelves away in quite dramatic fashion in size uh, submarine canyons are just an extension. So for a volcano, it's just literally the tip of the iceberg. So we've had to work very hard to find a suitable marine route where the submarine cable can follow uh, slopes that uh, are not greater than 5%. So we have found a, a suitable route that comes into Obia on the northeast of the island, into the bay. Uh, and on the western side into Chateau Belair, uh, where again we come up a, a submarine canyon uh, into Richmond Beach, where we'll connect into the existing, oh sorry, the, the, the being built terrestrial network that Digicel is deploying around the island. And this will then complete the loop around the uh, I was fortunate enough to be on these surveys and quite a beautiful few weeks it was in the, in the lovely Grandian Islands. And, um, what I'm showing here is the proposed landings uh, in each of the uh, islands. We'll work our way through from north to south. Uh, in Beckway, um, looking at the two options, we have chosen the, a landing in the uh, southern end of uh, Lower Bay, which will be south enough or southern enough to avoid any of the anchorage, uh, anchorages in the north and the cruise liners coming in, connecting directly into digital cell sites uh, there. Uh, we've been working with Mustique Company Limited and Mustique um, to land the cable in Endeavour Bay uh, near the airport um, and in Canawan in Nens Bay um, north of the airport there. Um, all of these uh, survey data, as you can see in the summary here, provide a fascinating insight to the types of seabed that we have off the Grenadine Islands. Continuing over, uh, into Union, um, we have an interesting and much more flatter but uh, seabed typified by extensive sound waves uh, into a landing near the airport. We will again connect um, uh, into the airport with a uh, new beach manhole um, and into the uh, infrastructure to digital delivery. Uh, moving further south now to Grenada and to Caracou, uh, landing in Hillsborough Bay outside of the marine protected area on that island, and uh, and then finally to Grenada as we saw earlier. So how do we do all this work? Well, um, the uh, cable route study, as I said, uh, the, sorry, the cable route study, the desk-based cable route study was uh, looking at all uh, potential engineering, physical, biological, environmental, and socio-economic elements of the proposed routes, uh, looking at the viability of of being able to be installed on that marine route. And we then therefore undertook this survey, which also included topographical surveys at the beach landing, 
and dive and swim surveys, uh, which were particularly important when we're looking at um, some of the more sensitive marine environmental habitats. So this work was undertaken during September and November last year. Uh, images on the left there of the offshore survey vessel and um, some of the images of uh, what you um, can expect to have seen if you're on the survey vessel. The survey data for those who are interested, the, the multi-beam echo sound of survey is, is uh, simply, as it might suggest, your simple echo sound which has got multi-beams that carry and, um, and be able to provide a multi-beam swathe of the seabed uh, to provide a, a colourful and, and ge geographically and vertically referenced image of the seabed from which we can choose the appropriate route. Uh, this is also supplemented by slow scan sonar, which gives a textural image of the seabed and a subbottom profiler that gives a, a short range image of the seabed um, underneath the bottom of the seabed. Just, we're just finishing the um, research report, uh, which is being delivered to the governments uh, currently. Next slide, please. So, you actually won't see much of this construction at all if you're on the islands. All of this is on the seabed. Um, the only aspect of construction that is involved in the project is um, construction of a beach manhole, which is only marginally larger than any manhole that you will see being constructed on shore for any uh, fiber rollout. So this beach manhole, uh, dimensions included uh, on the screen there, will be used to splice the terrestrial cable, which the Digicel will be deploying, with the submarine cable, which will be deployed from the cable ship. Um, the construction of this beach manhole, I would say the specifications for which have been provided to the government, and the government kindly and promptly, efficiently permitted, um, will enable the construction of both the beach manhole uh, with due regard to those local regulations. And once uh, constructed, uh, the um, reinstatement will take place such that uh, you will see nothing more than a, a beach manhole lid. Uh, the beach manhole will have seaward facing ducts into which the cable will be pulled. And currently, uh, the is looking at constructing these beach manholes, um, say January, February, more likely in February time frame. Again, you know, just to reaffirm, no construction here in Kingston because we're using an existing manual. Um, moving on to the actual uh, marine cable installation. Following these approvals, the uh, IC International Telecom ship uh, will collect the submarine cables being manufactured in Norway, uh, load that, and bring it across the Atlantic. So it's quite an international endeavour. So, how much of these, how big are these? submarine cables. I, I do a lot of work with the United Nations and promoting our industry and believe me a lot of NGOs keep, keep talking about pipelines this big. Well I'll pass this round. Well you'll be able to come and see it but this is it. That's as big as it is and it's not as big as that but that's the case. Inside that is a submarine cable. Uh, maximum 30 millimetres in diameter. It contains the fibres which are in the middle. Um, the size of the human head. That is the internet ladies and gentlemen. That's what your social media, your Amazon shopping, your government connectivity relies on. Nothing more than that. Uh, that has a, a copper core and two, uh, two, two, two strands of uh, armour to protect it, just to protect it from any fishing and anchoring that might be present where we are uh, placing the cable, of which there will be minimal because we're routing the cable to avoid such threats. In deeper water, we have a narrow cable where we don't have those um, threats from fishing and anchoring, and that is even smaller than that. Um, between the landings, uh, we will then deploy what uh, you'll see on the bottom left there, it's got a branching unit, so that splits the cable between the trunk, between Spencer and Grenada, and the landings to each of the islands. And that enables the fibre connectivity between the islands, and between the islands, and the main islands of Spencer and Grenada. So when is this going to take place? This will take place between May and June. Um, I'm sure did yourself make sure that you're more than aware of the impending installation and it'll be quite a spectacle for the island, particularly for the Grand Islands that have not seen this before. Um, the work itself will be pretty short, I mean it's only two days per island, if that. Uh, we'll be, the ship will be arriving, 
and uh, bringing the kelp to shore, and it's floated ashore. Um, in, and all that will happen is a, a, a trench will be excavated on the be uh, beach one day prior. The cable will be pulled ashore into the beach manhole through the secret place of ducks, tested, and the, the trench will be backfilled. The cable in the intertidal zone to the high low water uh, will have what's called articulated pipe placed on it to protect it, and it will be covered over. And we all hope. Um, IT, Deep Blue, Digital, Government, you'll never see it again because that means it's been installed properly and, and has not broken. And that cable, when installed there, should be good for a good 25 years and it'll, in fire excess, provide the capacity requirements of the islands during that time. So that installation should all be uh, complete by um, at the end of June, early July. And we then follow a process of commissioning the cable, uh, which in itself is not a lengthy process. And then there's some final acceptance procedures uh, that we have and the digital have will then uh, enable the system to lift and deliver to the, to the government. Um, I think I've summarised the installation uh, as best I can. I'm sure you have some questions later. Um, Greg, do you have anything to add uh, to that? No, not really, um, but feel free to come and put in the cable after. Um, if you're interested, so if you have any specific questions, I'll be around for a bit after as well. More technical towards the installation side. Okay, now, in, in wrapping that up, I think then uh, Chris would like to provide some, um, uh, some closing remarks on, on uh, submarine cable um, and how it will, in reality, deliver some of the expectations that will be laid out by the government in advance. I, I just wanted to outline uh, a couple more things so that uh, weren't previously um, spoken about in detail by my colleagues uh, um, from the government of St. Vincent and Delta. And this is something that Digicel personally is, is very proud of uh, to shout about. This uh, partnership with the government of St. Vincent is projected uh, for St. Vincent uh, to create over 500 job jobs throughout the car uh, project and its deployment. Digicel throughout this time is committed to ensure that our local populations and our Vincentians are given first priority for all employment opportunities. Um, we have a, a great deal of, of investment in St. Vincent and we have a great deal of investment in Vincentians on the whole. And we would like to see employment opportunities and uh, growth in the technology sector that fuels this type of employment. We expect Carson through this project and through upcoming developments and infrastructure surrounding Carson to also add to the possibilities and, and development of extensions and we're very proud to be a part of it. Just, just to give you an idea, this, uh, this is an international, internationally viewed project Roxanne and her team have, have done a great job of it, ensuring that the local public company, we've seen lots of articles in the local press, but throughout the region and international markets, people are talking about Carson. So I want to ensure that we are also very aware of what's happening and that we're cognizant of the type of magnification that St. Vincent is under right now because of this level of technological development with the government. <coughs> I just want to hand back to Roxanne really quickly um, because this public consultation and uh, stakeholder engagement is about the Vincentians and uh, their understanding of the project. So the grievance mechanism will create for, for concerns and questions to be brought to the government and digital and to clarify any concerns that may exist. Just want to speak briefly on the grievance redress mechanism called the GRM. Um, on any given project, especially a large project of this nature that involves people, and there's always a process where 
we will establish so that persons can be able to lodge the grievance. Um, whether he still concern the problem that, or whatever claim that the person may have, there is a process that we will put in place where you can able to lodge those complaints. Now the government of civil society recognizes the importance of the GRM as an integral tool to be used during the implementation of this project. Of course, this is an element of good governance and it is really to educate the public about the legal rights and avenues for redress. Uh, we are in the process of establishing the document. Um, it is a collaboration team between the government and DigiCell. And when that document is completed, it will be made available publicly so that you will know exactly what is the process to, process to follow. And of course, the grievances can be already or it can be written from and um, you will be notified um, very soon as to where the process. So, President, I just want to let you know that it will be in place, but we have not completed um, the process. Just to based on the time scales established earlier, um, this grievance process can, can be initiated by the general public at any point in time from the start of construction, which we um, established would be from about February this year, um, straight through to um, the operation of the subsea system itself. So we will have those mechanisms in place before construction begins um, in February. Apart from that, um, I don't think there's anything else that the, the panel wants to add, so we will formally put to, um, our presentation to you as a close, at a close, um, and we'll now open up the floor to questions, comments, uh, um, <coughs> just, to, just overall concerns. system, the ferry system, because a lot of people will no longer travel on the ferries to and from the main island. So uh, that's going to be a slight drawback in your revenue. Just a couple of things. Thank you. Thank you very much for your concerns. Um, want to address the first question? This project and, and all of the infrastructure that's being put in, does, it only adds the capacity to the existing network. Um, all, all legislation that is in place presently to address intellectual property rights, all um, cybercrime acts that are in place now would apply probably even more so in a more stringent manner to this new infrastructure. But CARSIP itself is just making that more efficient. We're making it easier for the government to be able to identify 
if there are issues in different parts of the country because our police stations, our hospitals, all of these uh, entities will now be interconnected. So they will probably be doing, a, or they will be doing a better job at policing to prevent against the violation of those rights. But as far as the security factor um, is concerned, everything that is in place now to protect intellectual property will be maintained and we're, we're confident that uh, that will also be improved. Okay, um, in response to the comment made on transportation, the benefits to the loss, the loss in the transportation sector to persons not having to come to St. Vincent to collect or to apply for passports and such um, services. I think what is important here is the net benefit to our residents. What we are concerned most about, what we recognize to the ferry operators, we may lose a couple of dollars you know, here and there as persons come to St. Vincent for such services. What we're looking at more so is delivering net benefits to persons who are distances away from Kingstown. So just to say, while that is a, is a concern, the debt benefits to the residents would be greater than the loss um, in transportation cost. Bonjour tout le monde. Tout le monde bien? I tell everybody looked at me surprised, but I deliberately started this way because I am going to address the issue of consumer rights and consumer protection. Good program, it is needed, but in the longer run, the services that will be provided and the persons, those services will impact. As we all know, anything put together by mankind, somehow, somewhere, somebody will mess up for one reason or another. In this country, in the free islands mentioned under this project, St. Lucia where I'm from, St. Vincent where I now reside, and Renata where I have been many times, you have many persons whose educational levels cause problems when they try to access the services by digital when they call into the operator. And I hope the digital reps here will take into consideration that with the thrust to increase the service that they will also take this into consideration. That digital will also take into consideration the speed of data over the system. As a founding member of the Senusha Consumer Association we need to look at the rights of consumers. I'm being blunt, and the Minister Gonzalez is there. We have had many, many chats on consumer legislation. This is somewhere within the OECS Commission, somewhere we're hoping it to get legislated as soon as possible. Because we've got, the consumers are always left holding the short end of the stick. Whether we like it or not, it started with both phone to cable and wireless to flow, even with digital, why did work with in same motion? Somebody messes up and the consumer is left holding the short end of the stick. I appreciate and I've complained. You go to the government buildings, the internet service there is slower than molasses in winter. People have problems getting work done. In the Grenadines, it's even worse. It's better you start swimming across the Atlantic, you will get a meal across faster. Both Digicel and Flow offered free G. And I do not know if it is capital G or small G. But speak to the consumers, they have serious problems. In this part of the world, we are playing catch up with technology because of the internet quality provided by our service providers. And with all this being said and done, one plus one equals two. 
but will the consumers get the two one plus one supposed to give them? Or will they get a 1.5? You'll need to answer those questions because I do not see anybody from the Consumer Association here. But the public needs that assurance that when they pick up their cell phone, irrespective of the 13,000 devices connected, and if you tell them download speed is one gig, they will get one gig. If you tell them upload speed is X byte, they will get that. These are the major concerns of the consumers. These are the major concerns of the consumers. Government is a consumer, but the people who are affected are the little man who has to buy his phone. The old lady who lives up in Oya dials the operator and listens to a long litany of instructions she could barely understand. These issues concerns me as one involved in, cons in the whole consumer fight. Sorry to say, my recession colleagues, for whatever reason, they have taken the moot of it. But we need to address those issues. I appreciate what is being done throughout the Grenadines. It is needed. But what is about the old lady who has to pick up a cell phone? It's not working. She calls the operator and she has to listen to a long litany of instructions she can barely understand. What's about the student who has to prepare an assignment? 10 o'clock, she cannot finish. 11 o'clock, she can't get, go to bed because the internet is extremely slow. And even more important, how resilient will be that new system when the Eastern Caribbean is in the, on the, in the forefront of hurricanes? Thank you. Thank you very much, Faye. Um, thank you so much for actually bringing, uh, bringing your concern to, to the panel. I'd, I'd like to address it in, in a couple of parts. Firstly, I'd like to reestablish that Digicel has always been and will continue to deliver a dedicated and world-class product to the Caribbean and St. Vincent and the Grenadines in particular in this situation. With a project of this nature, um, we're speaking about Carson, um, Digicel further pledges a, a commitment to, to delivering a state-of-the-art fiber network to both the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, along with a state-of-the-art and world-class product to the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. With the, the CARSIP project, we do also intend to bring fiber to the site. And that, that component of the project increases the redundancy and integrity of our network. So previous concerns about a dependency solely on a microwave network are resolved. We have also just implemented LTE across St. Vincent and Grenadines, and we have over 40 sites on LTE right now, including remote areas like Greg's, which had previously had it. Um, we have previously intermittent coverage gaps, and we have worked to remediate to that. In places like Chateauvillier that have been on 2G previously, they are now at 4G. And we believe it's important, and we have actually, we're mandated to keep improving the service to Vincentians, and we're proud to say that we have done so. Along with LTE comes improvement in quality and speeds, and I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Once you experience the product, you'll understand it does exactly what we expect it to. Your concern for the Grenadines um, is exactly why this lot three, we believe, is such an integral part of this project. The fiber to the main Grenadine Islands, and then the microwave delivery to islands like Nairo, Karakou, um, Petit Saint Vincent, will improve any previously missing or, or efficient levels of coverage down there, and we're confident that by the end of this CARSIP project, all concerns to the Grenadines will be 
alleviated. There's, there's one more aspect of, of Carson. And at the beginning, when I did the introduction, I was spoken to a lot too in both Grenada, Anderson, and St. Lucia. And Digicel is, is very keen on trying to get to block two on the way in St. Vincent. And we will continue to progress discussions with the government to try and get the school's network up and running here as well. But we're still in conversations. And in the near future, we do hope to have another dedicated product to the St. Vincent government and the school's network under Carson. And that is what resilience is. We have an, an active and 99% uh, and functioning microwave network right now. The fiber backbone adds a second level of resilience in the event that something does happen as a result of a hurricane, then the fiber network takes care of all traffic and the system stays up 100% of the time. Establish. Um. Of course, I want to congratulate the government on establishing such a project. We disagree upon much, we don't have resources to do certain things. And it's clear that if we partner up, we can do a lot. This is a very important project. And the things that are possible are only limited by our imagination. We think of the government trying to establish a health information system, for instance, and not having the infrastructure in place to link all the clinics so that the nurses and the doctors and another ordinary clinic day can input information and for government to keep proper checking of things like medication. You think of better policing. Not all the police stations being linked in a manner like never before. You think of having a proper 911 system in place. The benefits are numerous, numerous. And it brings possibility to everything essential. I mean to say we, we, we live in a country in, in all local contexts that is scarce of natural resources. But what we can develop and maintain is great matter. And it gives every boy, every girl the opportunity to create content, put it on an infrastructure whose market is the world. Very important question. Um, possibilities like bringing the fiber to your homes. You know, I'm talking to my auntie in the United States, she said, okay, oh boy, I have 50 megabits to come into my house. You know? Those speeds are only achievable from the service provider if you have fiber coming to your home and so on. And speaking about the battle between, you know, and so on, DTCL promises to provide a 10, 10 gigabit connection between the distribution sites. And from the distribution sites coming into your building, you have a 1 gigabit connection. But those are not my concerns. Present. Those are good things. I, over the years, have bought maybe 5 or 6 digital phones and shoot them over one by one. Because where I live, I can only get a signal on one area of my porch downstairs. No else. And I get pretty annoyed if I'm driving to a place and I'm, I'm in conversation and all of a sudden, I'm saying hello, 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 I am, I'm not getting any kind of connectivity. I want to know if, you know, during the design of this project and so on, that was considered. Right? Because speed is not access. So how, how do you, 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 you plan to overcome that? Right? The other thing with um, the submarine cables now, specifically, um, we're through the document. And um, generally, when you have a project of this nature, you have, it's an infrastructure project, you have your designs, and during the implementation period, especially in this specific context where over the past couple months we have seen many outbreaks and in Trinidad, a couple of them per week or so. We remember the history of this Caribbean that we live in where Port Royal City disappeared. And we are living at the edge of big margins. 
As a matter of fact, to be precise, we are living at the zone of subduction where the American plate is going under the Caribbean plate. So you find frequent actions yet so frequent volcanic activity, frequent um, earthquakes and so on. You know, I'm aware that within the recent years, all subsea systems between St. Vincent and the Southern End were interrupted because of King of Jenny and so on. Um, what monitoring mechanisms we have would we have in place and would we be presented with, you know, as built specifications after the whole, you know, things done and so on. And a more very serious, very, very serious concern. I noted that government will not own the submarine fiber going to the Grenadines or to between Ovia and Chateaulet. And I'm told that we own capacity. Now, in my understanding, capacity is an intangible asset that will generally, you know, ex you know, cease to exist, possibly, upon the expiration of a contract. Um, after this, these 15 years are over, how do we continue? Uh, I don't know what is written in the contract, or should government decide to we'll boy whatever? Because one can never really tell the future. What we really up to? Those are my concerns. Let me, let me speak to the, the first concern, which I believe was poor connectivity and, and how this project um, stands to improve that. Carson is 100 gig technology. What Carson does is provide um, a pipeline that uh, that facilitates the level of capacity needed by our network for the day-to-day -day usage of our customers. In order to take full advantage of the infrastructure of Carson, I would have mentioned that Digicel is presently upgrading our entire network from 3G, 4G to LTE. The LTE platform with a state-of-the-art network is what solves that problem you're talking about when you're in your veranda or in your kitchen and you can't get the um, type of coverage that you desire. Within the next couple of months, Digicel would have revamped its entire mobile network and all of those problems should ideally be resolved. The only way that you may still be facing those problems is if you have not done the simplest thing, and it's something that Digital is asking all customers to go out and do right now, and that is upgrade your SIM to the new LTE SIMs to ensure that you're able to receive the new upgraded network service that we have in place. So make sure you do that, and then and come back to me and let me know if you're still having problems and then we can take it from there again. Um, I'll hand over to Nigel right now and he will address the infrastructural concerns under what. Um, th thank you for your observations. I thought we were, were great actually. Um, I like to say um, the fact that you referred to the uh, really limited by our imagination because there's a lot of submarine fiber optic cables available all around the world. I've been with uh, this company for almost two years on base on solution. I've got prior to that, I spent 10 years in Verizon, and I know the benefits that these submarine cables can bring to e health, um, to e business, to the tourist industry, and you know, all these things are net benefit providers to, to countries. And you should very much consider this as a very, very positive introduction and improvement upon your existing. Um, technology on the islands and, and it, it is bringing you up, up to date with many of the other island nations in the world and it should be viewed as a, as a very positive step. We, we have to undertake an ESIA as part of the World Bank process and you naturally have to look at the, the negative impacts but I guarantee you that, that with these small submarine cables that have a temporal spatial 
um, impact. They're very, very limited. They're very small. They're benign, these cables. But the benefits they provide far outweigh anything that you can possibly consider as negative about them. And if you look at the long-term future proofing to your island that this provides, the 100 gig technology is only the first, it's the norm now, but this system will be able to provide more bandwidth. Bandwidth is important, it's not speed, you've already got speed, it's the bandwidth. When you're wanting to use e-health facilities, and you might, when a doctor wants to be able to undertake an operation remotely, you need bandwidth, and this is what it will provide. Very soon, and already in fact around the world, 400 gig uh, technology is, is becoming the norm. And then in some countries, you're moving to 5G uh, solutions, which are admittedly not for remote locations, but it does future-proof your um, system. And the other aspect I'll just add, since you raised it, which is a, a good one, um, and I know this first hand because I laid the first flight property cable across the North Atlantic in 1989. When you lay across uh, seafloor ridges and spreading zones, you have to take due regard to that movement. So what we do is we lay the cable with enough slack to enable the cable to span not only the gaps that you have at the moment on those margins, but how those margins are going to move. So we future-proof these cables as well from a technology point of view. In fact, in, in recent hurricanes in Irma and Maria, no cables fail. You know, they don't, by definition, get impacted by hurricanes. The cable landing stations, if they're vulnerable, and they're most of them aren't because they're planned to be resilient, may have water ingress, but the systems stay up. And these systems stay up beyond and continue to provide service beyond the microwave links that you've got. And the final point is, indeed, as I pointed out, um, we've routed the cable to avoid the most relevant geologic um, location here, which is Kick and Jenny. And as you rightly pointed out, that took out both cables at that time. So if that happens again, this one will keep going. I promise it, but it's, void, it's, it's planned to avoid that very feature that you brought up. So thank you for raising that, because I think that was a good point, and to really um, stress uh, beyond the presentation I gave. Um, hopefully that answers your questions. I don't know, Greg, did you want to add anything from a technology point of view? Um, no. After uh, 15 years, the government has access rights to the cable. So that is already the country. Yes, I, I want to come up because Caswellan, when he said he, he threw away his phone, and I could now understand why for the last four or five years I couldn't even reach him <laughs> at any point in time. And he threw away the phone now, you know, and I told you so the other day, and you told me no, but okay. <laughs> That's important. That's important. I hear it because I'm not sure if in the presentation we had an idea about cost breakdown in the partnership in terms of what the government is contributing to cover to CASIP and what Digicel is going to do, there will be a significant amount from Digicel. What that breakdown is, I think maybe the press and so forth would have liked to know that. I'm not sure if you've mentioned it last year, but I think that's an important. Now, I am particularly interested in two other aspects. Um, that, uh, you know, this concert is focused on the submarine but I want to just hear a little bit more, if you may, about the terrestrial concept. And that loop that was mentioned from Chateaubelle to Obia, is that just um, a process of closing that loop for the terrestrial process and, 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 and what the significance of it is? But something more important, we are also engaging as a major project, geothermal energy. And that project, the, the drilling is about to start, but I would have seen where some of the cable actually had a mechanism by which you could transmit electricity with fiber optics in the middle. It kind of killed two girls with one stone. And I, I like the, the fact this is and a similar size cable. Could you give some kind of comment on this? Obviously, this is 25 years ago with the change, but I would hope that the EIA that would be done could at least be made fully available to us so that in case or in the possibility that we do want to run further cables, we will be able to know those particular routes and those basic environmental impact assessment, which might change in, in, within a year or so, but at least it will be very useful in terms of 
implementing the geothermal and if it comes to that, any kind of submarine process to get for the electricity to do whether the beans or elsewhere. I know we have our other other process of getting electricity to be solar and so on, but I would, I would just like to get an idea about that. Thank you, Dr. Jameson, in response to the first question, um, the first question we're in is, um, it will cost the government over $26.6 .6 million for 15 years for this policy. Um, I guess this shall be one to speak on the Try and answer the last question first. Um, uh, it's of course um, possible to install um, fiber optic uh, cables that have got power conductors through them to provide uh, electrical connectivity, but clearly this isn't um, the case in this cable, it's not being contracted for electrical transmission. But that's not to say, of course, that the survey data that we've collected, which is essentially um, the clients, um, could be used for that. I'm not familiar with the science, maybe, uh, just to say that because of the seabed we found, much of the route is in shallower water, so I'm guessing that some of the areas that, that are of interest are in deeper water. And certainly, we have a lot of survey data north of uh, St Vincent, where indeed we surveyed the route for closing that loop between Shetland Blair and Oyer. Uh, and, and just, uh, as, just so you're aware, a lot of submarine cables, when they have expended their useful life, are uh, reinvented as, as for scientific purposes, um, so it's entirely possible that they, they can be done um, and be used for monitoring of seismic um, and, and other technology, if if so needed for um, other deep sea industries, for example. Um, but just to say that obviously this one's not designed to do that, but survey data, significant survey data has been collected. So it's infinitely um, upgradable. 
So, so you know, if we say the initial capacity is um, one or even five gig, it's almost meaningless because it's it's scalable. Um, you know, ultimately to a to a figure that will far exceed ever what you need. And the reason for that is that the a the vacuum, the glass the vacuum, it is is able to carry a huge amount of bandwidth because the submarine line terminating equipment technology on the terrestrial side is ever increasing in, in, in complexity and the uh, signal, digital signal processing and all the forward error correction enables more and more capacity to go down the same medium. So to part answer one of your questions, we have many cables around the world that would have been end of life about five years ago that are seeking and have new lives now because the transmission technology enables that same medium to have more um, capacity uh, transmitted down, thus extending their life. So uh, and it, uh, that's repeated systems. So this system, um, it, that, that, that could go on forever. And, and on top of that, because of the, um, the, the length of the system, because of the small delta in costs, we have probably more fibres than we'll ever need as well. So if you think every fibre has an ultimate capacity, we've now got 12 of them. Uh, and finally, the, the, unlike an electric cable, there is no induced electromagnetic field. So it's completely benign. So, so there's, there's little to no environmental impact or effect from this cable. Uh, and indeed, because of the reduced uh, impact from external aggression, which is by far the biggest risk to something cables around the world, fishing and anchoring, um, because of the reduced risk here, the many to place it on the seabed. Uh, in, in some areas, it will self bury but we see this will be planned so that we're avoiding any risk from any anchorages. Rule number one, we do group planning, avoid anchorages. And, and the very nature of the fisheries around the islands here is very artisanal. It's not a, an aggressive commercial, industrialised fisheries like we might have seen in the North Sea of Europe. So we fully expect to be able to place the table on the seabed and it to remain there safely for its contract life and its design life. And hopefully that answers your question. My question is, with this new fiber optic cable that you're installing, will there be space available for competitors? Because at the end of the day, it's the consumers who are going to have to bear the price. So I want to know, like here in St. Vincent, there are two providers of service, telecommunication service. Will that cable be allowed? Will other companies be allowed to use that cable that the cell is putting in place? That's an excellent question. <laughs> so the answer is yes. Um, in the CARS contract, Digicel is uh, obligated to make this uh, submarine cable open access. So um, obviously there will be negotiations and costs associated, but um, in, in short, the answer is yes, the, the cable is open access. We asked a question about the IXP, uh, because, uh, although, because the reason I ask is that obviously Digicel are doing a great job, they're doing this job, etc. But if, uh, I think that um, we need to have an IXP working because sooner or later, or perhaps in the future, there are providers who specialize in various sectors, be it health or be it uh, financial sector or whatever. And um, it means that we have healthy competition rather than uh, not dealing with it and having going back to a single provider again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, of course, the XP is up and running. Um, we just need to do some work during this year to get um, more traffic running and so that we can able to produce those stats so we can know what is happening with our local traffic. Um, but we already have Digicel and the other providers on board, so they already um, have their connections and the ISP, which has already been established.